The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hello, and welcome back to the Massive Open Online Orchestration Course, Term 1. I'm your instructor, Thomas Goss. I'd like to thank all the students who gave me such a positive response to the first lesson when I released it two weeks ago. Hearing that my efforts on this channel have helped composers to develop makes this all worthwhile. Last week's lesson introduced the craft of scoring for unaccompanied violin, and assigned a two to three minute piece in your own voice as a composer. If you're a Patreon supporter in the Dotted Brev and Longa levels, then that assignment is now due. If you're supporting on Patreon at a different level, or taking this course as an open entrant, then you can look at today's date in one of two ways. First, you could treat today as an arbitrary cutoff point that you're not obligated to respect. And that's perfectly true. This is an open course, and it's designed to be used as a resource that will fit your development, whatever your level of commitment and available time. Or you could look on the deadlines that I've set with this course as tests to your own level of productivity and growth, and apply yourself according to the set schedule. That's also perfectly fine, but please remember that if you miss a deadline or fall behind, it's not the end of the world. It's just life. Do what you can do with the time that you've got. Our next logical step is to study violin and piano duo scoring. But before we launch into that topic, let's explore the implications of what you scored last week. If the lecture introduced new information to you, with a new perspective on how to shape your work, then the result should be a composition that's moved you forward as an artist. Since this MOOC specifically addresses how your music relates to a live musician, then the true value of your progress can only be redeemed if a musician plays your piece. So let's study the process of connecting with performers first, since that practical step is just as important to your progress as a composer. Much of what I'm going to say in this talk is an extension of the principles I discussed in the Intro to Orchestration video Chapter 9, Getting Performed. If you haven't seen that yet, click the link on the video thumbnail below and go have a look. And maybe even if you have seen it, but not since it was released last year. So, as you've seen, there's a certain philosophy to all this. If you follow Goss's law, then your category of available performer should be at least equal to your own status as a composer. If you're a semi-pro composer, then you should be reaching out to players who are also semi-pro, and so on. The exception here is that if you can reach higher, then you should. There's no greater lesson than to have an experienced professional look at your work and give you feedback. There are several different ways to get in touch with musicians, depending on your own particular circumstances as a composer, and what level of help you want from this course. The most fundamental is just to ask an acquaintance. If you're involved with music as a performer, then you may know several people who might be willing to read your score and give you some pointers. These could be anyone from fellow students at school all the way up to freelance players or orchestra members. You can always expand this pool of potential talent by getting out more and getting involved with artistic projects, even if that just means being in the audience at a performance. Many a commission has been proposed at a post-concert reception or pub crawl. If you're not personally connected to concert musicians, then you can always try to contact them directly through other means. Sometimes freelance musicians will have exchanges where they list their availability and what kind of projects they'd like to do. You can also try contacting orchestra or ensemble management. When I was just starting out as a composer, I called the manager of a regional orchestra, whom I knew casually. I asked her for contacts of players who might want to record a string quartet I'd composed, and I downplayed the request, saying that I'd be happy to work with anyone who was available. She very wisely recommended me to the best possible people in the orchestra, 
principal and co-principal players who did huge amounts of freelance work in the scene. Some of these players went on to work extensively with me in future projects, and that saved me time and effort down the line. Short of the first two options, reaching out to people you know or contacting organizations, there's a third option that usually leads to some kind of result, and that is the grapevine. Players know players, have their numbers, and can recommend you on to someone else if they're unavailable. You should expect that any conversation starting with the first two options will eventually end up here, as musicians dig through their little black books in search of names and phone numbers. I've found many brilliant players this way, and recorded some of my best sessions with people whom I've called out of the blue a few days before. That's how to contact your players. But once you've got them cornered at the buffet table or on the phone, what are you going to say to them? Keep in mind that it doesn't matter whether they're a top-level session musician or a fellow youth orchestra player. What you've got to do at this point is to pitch your project. You have to describe exactly what you want to accomplish in a way that makes them want to work with you. And here's where we also have to decide as composers what kind of opportunity we're aiming to create for them. If it's simply a chance to hang out musically, then pitch that. When I was a student musician, I often hung out with others over scores and new pieces. There was no pay involved, and we got a lot out of connecting and sharing our perspectives, for whatever that was worth. If you can also play their scores, or play duets with them, or do some other musical favor, like arranging, then you can also get more benefits from the social side of the equation. Sometimes an informal request like this can lead to a whole self-organized and self-performed concert of original works, and these can be hugely fun with the right mixture of talent. On the other hand, let's not forget one of my equations for professional success. Get paid, pay others, work out exactly what you're supposed to be doing, and do it so well that they want to work with you again every chance they get. This is from another Intro to Orchestration video, Part 7, Career Advice, in a section called Know Your Parameters. Here I share a very difficult lesson that I had to learn early on. When talented people did me favors instead of getting paid, they didn't always give me their best effort, and my projects got into trouble because I'd expected a pro level of commitment. Now, in the case of this MOOC, our aims definitely aren't to turn every recording session into a professional recording for commercial release. We just want our scores read, and to get feedback about how our craft is evolving. Nevertheless, a pro player will give you a pro opinion, and will feel a personal sense of responsibility if it's understood from the beginning that this is a paid gig. You can look up the current musicians' union rates, or ask around to see what the going rate is for a recording session in your area. Some players might want more or less, depending on whether they feel it will be more or less work. If you don't know what's fair, don't be afraid to ask them outright what they'd charge. This is a very common question, and there's nothing to be timid about. So let's get back to that conversation with your musician, ready to hear your pitch. You might make any kind of proposal and say it any way, but here are a few general steps. First, introduce yourself and compliment their playing if you've heard them. This isn't just good manners or flattery. It's essential for the player to know that you're approaching them specifically because their abilities have inspired you to suggest a collaboration. If this is a cold call, mention who recommended them to you and how you got their number, so you don't sound like a creep. Then tell them exactly what you intend to accomplish and how they might fit into that plan. In the case of this MOOC, you might mention that you're currently taking an online course in orchestration, and that for your first assignment you had to compose a short work for unaccompanied violin. You'd like to have your piece read by a musician, and you're offering a fee of whatever amount. Perhaps adapt this if you really do want to just share musical ideas with your mates. In this pitch, it's best to keep the proposal as concise as possible, instead of rambling on and on. It's better to let them ask for further details, or give you a few suggestions, than to sound like a dictatorial producer type who will boss everyone around, even though you don't know what you're doing. If they tell you that they can't do it, then don't be afraid to ask for a recommendation for another possible player. The more polite and reasonable of a person you are, the more likely you'll get a referral. The reverse is also true. The less polite you are, the less of that grapevine you'll see. These players are often good friends, who definitely want to avoid handing out each other's phone numbers to jerks. Furthermore, some of those whom you may call are my personal friends and colleagues, 
I don't want to start an avalanche of rude composers acting haughty with musicians on the telephone. So be cool, and let's turn the many opportunities that may arise from this course into a way to grow our composer community instead of giving it a bad reputation. When you're planning for your reading, give a thought to the parameters. How much money or exchanged effort can you afford? Will you record or video the reading? Where will you hold the session? If this is just a reading, of course you shouldn't be too particular about this last detail, as I've gotten great results from sitting down with musicians in practice rooms or community halls, or even just my living room. Your player might have an idea about this if you can't figure it out, or may suggest somewhere better than what you have planned. Once your reading starts, then you should expect the musician to play it through once or twice before giving you feedback. Be patient with them if the music doesn't sound perfect at first. The general reason why a piece may sound less than what we expect is because we've composed it in a tricky way. It's rarely a professional musician's fault if they are really doing a conscientious job with your score. If things aren't sounding right, then tell your player what you had planned and ask if there's a way you might adjust your scoring to achieve a better effect. This lesson's curriculum post has a worksheet of parameters you can use to analyze your own work in a reading session, and build on what you hear. Make a copy of it and take it along to your session. Be aware of quantitative versus qualitative feedback. You really want the former, a quantity of tips and thoughts about how practical and playable your work is. You want to notice how well your score fits the player's technique, and whether your grasp of our lesson goals is improving like scoring for convenient bowing, designing your phrases in natural ways, and contrasting the registers of the violin. Take my advice and don't ask your musicians how much they liked your piece. They'll let you know that, either directly by making a comment, or indirectly through the way they play it and discuss its technique. In fact, it doesn't really matter that much at this stage, though it's always a nice ego boost to get praise, and even better if the player asks to perform your work. However, Praise is a very temporary thing. You get over it even quicker than negative criticism. If you make the focus of the session on how good your music sounds, whatever that means, then you'll lose precious moments in which you might improve your craft. It's really the same waste of time if the player gets stuck on how bad he thinks your work sounds. Focus on what needs fixing, and how better to score things in the future, and you can't help but to get useful information instead of having to either polish or repair your ego in the aftermath. One final thought. The process of one composer hiring one professional violinist to look at one very short piece of music may not be very economical for most composers out there. You might hire them for a one-hour minimum session and run out of things to ask after the first 10 or 15 minutes. But there's a very simple way to get around this problem. Join forces with other composers and share the costs. Let's say that your musician charges 60 euros for a one-hour reading session. If three composers join forces, then they only have to spend 20 euros each, or four composers can share an hour for 15 euros apiece. There are some caveats here, though. There will have to be a reasonable level of technical demands from each score. Rather than one hugely difficult score, taking most of the time and effort away from a few easier scores. I suggest having strict timekeeping, and for readings to focus in on shorter sections of a score if the entire work is really an enormous effort for the player. Also, all participating composers should have a copy of every score, and read along for the entire session, learning with their mates whether their own score is on the music stand or not. I've actually learned quite a bit about scoring from listening to feedback about other composers' works alongside my own. This collaboration between composers often leads to the question, should we form a permanent group of composers that works together to create more opportunities? I'll answer that question in the warm-up to next lesson's lecture. For now, though, you have my blessings and best wishes on your efforts to reach out to players for feedback, and I hope you get as much out of the process as I have in the past. Now, on to this week's lecture, Violin Piano Duo Scoring. Last week, I introduced you to the genre of unaccompanied violin, which, though it has several key masterworks, is still relatively unexplored territory. Not so the violin-piano duo. From the Baroque through to the classical and romantic periods, composers have contributed heavily to this genre, and continue to do so up to this day, 
it's much easier to conceive, compose, and also to perform works in which the violin need not take every role at once, soloist and accompanist, melodic, harmonic, rhythmic, and self-contrapuntal. It's more customary for violin works to feature a soloist with an accompanist, enjoying the fuller sound and wider range of contrasts. If the accompanist is sensitive and their part well scored, then the piano is an ideal partner to the violin. Let's remember that just as the violin was designed to approximate the human voice, the piano was first developed as a support instrument for singers. Of course, those early forte pianos were much more weak in delivery and brittle in sound, having smaller cases, doubled instead of today's tripled strings, and wooden frames instead of the cast iron we take for granted. Still, the character of the partnership remains, even if the piano has vastly evolved and the violin is nearly the same instrument it was when first developed. One thing that's also evolved is the scoring of this duo. In the Baroque period, it would be more accurately titled as Violin and Continuo, or Figured Accompaniment, which might be a harpsichord, or a harpsichord plus bass instrument of some sort such as a cello or viol. The music might be written out as one staff for violin and one for bass, and the accompanist would figure, literally, the rest out for himself. As earlier models of keyboard were adapted into the forte piano, chamber scoring evolved right along with it. Piano parts became entirely thorough composed, as the general technique of the instrument improved, largely due to J.S. Bach's most influential son, Carl Philipp Emanuel, who wrote the first comprehensive treatise on piano playing. C.P.E. Bach also helped to evolve the forms that would be used most heavily in the coming classical era, like the Sonata Allegro, the Fantasy, and the Rondo. He wrote many sonatas for piano plus solo instrument, including a very striking violin-piano duo sonata in C minor that's well worth studying. Its middle movement with extended low register passages is sheer poetry and brilliant scoring besides. The oncoming classical era's most significant development was the establishment of musical appreciation in the form of the dedicated amateurs who would promote, sponsor, and involve themselves with the careers of musicians. Many of these amateurs were fine musicians and musical thinkers in their own right, and supported the development of ever more complex and challenging music by attending concerts and purchasing sheet music. In the Vienna of Mozart's time, there was a shadow industry of musical soirees, in which wealthy amateurs would host informal performances in their own houses, often joining in alongside professional performers, who might also be their teachers. This is how the grapevine developed that I mentioned at the start of this lesson, and Mozart was only one of many performers in this self-made circuit of talent. In this period of musical ferment, the violin-piano duo sonata became a firmly established genre of its own, with many composers contributing to the repertoire. Mozart composed at least 17 complete sonatas, some of these with the peculiar character of having a piano part that's far more flashy and complicated than the violin part. Perhaps the maestro couldn't help showing off a bit, should he have to serve as accompanist, while at the same time he didn't want to score a violin part that might prove unplayable by his amateur patron. Nevertheless, Mozart's sonatas firmly established good practice in violin-piano duo scoring that would be utilized by composers to come. As you might expect, the complete mastery of the form was achieved by Beethoven. His ten sonatas progressed from tentative tributes to his teacher Salieri, to more daring essays, and penultimately to the towering Kreutzer Sonata, all within about four years, from 1799 to 1803. After his hearing loss prevented the personal performance of such works, Beethoven gave up on the violin sonata until 1816, when he composed his tenth and last for his most faithful patron, the Archduke Rudolf, to premiere as accompanist. 
we'll study Beethoven's approach when we return to the Kreutzer Sonata later in the lecture. For now, suffice to say that it was so compelling that much of the repertoire of the coming century was based on it. Many of the great Romantic composers contributed to the genre, like Schubert, Schumann, Weber, Mendelssohn, Brahms, and Grieg. As the 20th century approached, and chamber music became more specialized and less of an amateur's pursuit, composers eased off on their fascination with violin sonatas, but many of the leading composers wrote at least one or two, like Saint-Saëns, Elgar, Franck, Debussy, Nielsen, and Janáček. Ravel composed two, a lovely work of his youth that he never published, and a more mature sonata from his last creative period. In addition to all these sonatas I've mentioned, composers throughout the history of concert music have written works for violin and piano and many other forms, sets of variations, adaptations of opera themes, suites, rondos, nocturnes, fantasies, sketches, and simply pieces. But we don't have to score read everything from that list. For this lesson, I've selected a half dozen sonatas across several different periods. We'll take a look at them as I describe the scoring approaches that I'd like you to explore in your coursework. As I do, please remember that everything we studied last week also applies to this week's assignment. I'll work certain aspects of this in as I go, but your sense of craft should learn to add aspects of scoring to one another so that your toolbox gets ever more usable and resourceful. The first and most obvious scoring concern for this genre is the timbral character of each instrument. As I mentioned before, the piano has become ever greater in strength and projection, while the violin is essentially the same instrument it was a few centuries ago. Whatever your internal impression or DAW mock-up may sound like, the pianist will have to balance their playing to support rather than overwhelm the violinist. But let's look even deeper into the equation at the difference in sound and tone production. The violin is an instrument that can produce enormous variations of attack, sustain, inflection, and nuance. Probably the greatest advantages of the violin over the piano are a gradual bowed attack, vibrato, and the ability to increase and decrease force while holding a note. The piano, on the other hand, can only strike a key with whatever level of force and vary how long the note holds. Unless you're using experimental procedures, there's no way to ease into a tone and then make it pulse and crescendo. The piano's strengths lie in embracing these differences with subtleties of attack and sustain that create a world of meaning and inflection over the course of several notes in a phrase, rather than a single held note. Then, of course, there's the natural polyphony of the piano, in which multiple voices may create a well-ordered world of sound that functions almost orchestrally at times. So our paramount concern in duo scoring is to clearly understand and make use of the identities of these two instruments. Just as much as we found that registers on a single instrument like the violin can be contrasted to suggest separate voices or identities, we should understand that the contrast between violin and piano is part of the tension and interest that makes their collaboration unique. The clearer and more natural that you embrace the character of each instrument, the greater the possibilities for intrigue, conflict, resolution, and synergetic contrast. Perhaps the most classic example of establishing firmly separate yet interactive identities was composed by Beethoven in the opening to his Ninth Sonata, the Kreutzer Sonata that I mentioned before. The violin opens with a bold thematic statement, standing on its own without accompaniment. When it's finished, the piano echoes the statement with a slight reinterpretation, and then starts a dialogue with the violin, trading the theme back and forth a few times before the instruments truly give in to synchronous phrasing. There are a few legends about the composition of this piece, but if we ignore all the drama and innuendo, it's clear that Beethoven composed the sonata in anticipation of premiering it with the great American violin virtuoso George Bridgetower. He composed an introduction for Bridgetower, and then a response for himself on piano, and then a gradual meeting of the minds. Here's an example of how the identities of the instruments became elevated to the level of two great musical personalities of that age, and apparently the premiere was terrifically effective. <laughs> 
the whole question of identity, the consequences of registers are inescapable. The piano has one of the most smoothly integrated ranges of any instrument, with no discernible boundaries between neighboring notes. But different octaves and clefs can have decidedly different emotional and coloristic effects. Naturally, the violin's distinct registers are at an advantage here in making certain phrases and gestures more individual. Observe in Schumann's first violin sonata how the opening melody is scored sol G, giving it the intensity of a tenor register cello. The next passage is played mostly on the D string, with a more tender, moderated tone simply by virtue of the string's gentler character. But notice how the passion is unleashed after bar 19, when the melody commits itself to the higher strings. It's almost like getting three instruments for the price of one, each with a slightly different relationship to the piano. That naturally brings us around to the question of roles. One might presume this is obvious. The violinist is the soloist, and the pianist is the accompanist. But that's very simple-minded, and leads in the direction of predictable and uninteresting scoring. As Beethoven proves in the Kreutzer Sonata, it's possible for both instruments to be completely independent or interdependent. But this was no original inspiration of his. The whole repertoire of better composed scores reveals a mixture of these roles from the start. Simply check into any of Bach's sonatas for violin and continuo, like the G major sonata BWV 1019, which has a thorough composed keyboard part for most of the score. A high degree of interaction is demanded from both performers, not simply soloist and accompanist. Harpsichord is easily drowned out by violin, but the contrapuntal texture helps to make things clearer. As you score read your assignments this week, don't be a passive observer. Ask yourself constantly what role each player is taking. So as not to overdo things, let's boil these roles down into some simple categories, starting with thematic or melodic. Which instrument is taking the primary role in expressing the melody or forefront idea at any given time? I'm trying not to overstress the concept of melody here, as sometimes the main idea might be anything but melodic by the traditional definition. Perhaps a better way of thinking about it is to imagine it somewhat as a soloistic gesture, and whichever instrument gets the line is the soloist at that moment, as if this were an orchestral score. would appear to make all the other roles supporting roles, such as playing contrapuntally to the prominent idea, anything from the direction of melodic and harmonic motion to a well-written countermelody or an answering fugal subject. This works equally well on both instruments, and some composers delight in keeping the duo's roles ambiguous by trading between the two constantly. <laughs> 
few more essential roles are also universal in great scoring. Harmonic, rhythmic, and bass. It's a mistake to limit these roles to the pianist just because they have ten fingers. There are many passages in the literature in which violin parts syncopate, harmonize, and even hold down a pedal under a more prominent piano part. Once you identify these musical elements more systematically in your reading, then it's easier to understand why things work the way they do, and to move effortlessly between soloing and support. When I compose chamber music nowadays, I'm less focused on the question of soloist versus accompanist, and more concerned with energy. Which instrument is most involved with setting the level of energy in a passage? Does the soloist pull the energy forward with a melodic gesture, or does the accompanist push at the dynamics and tempo? Who cools the music down? Who sets the stage for eloquence and brashness? Sometimes the framing of an idea is just as important emotionally as the idea itself. This week's assignment is to compose a work that's aware of these basic concerns of scoring and uses them deliberately. Taking last week's developing approaches to bowing, melodic phrasing, and contrasts of register, and adding this week's understanding of roles between violin and piano and duo scoring, compose a two to three minute work that's a study in contrasts. This could be a contrast between musical ideas or moods or roles, or the individual characters of the instruments. It could even be a contrast between the idea of contrast and the idea of homogeneity. No matter which way you decide to score it, maintain a central identity of your own as a composer and celebrate your specific direction. Concert composers, work on something that could be expanded to a full-length piece for your catalog. Film composers, write something highly visual and evocative. Game and media composers, write something that would really work in your genre. Go have a listen to public or national radio for examples of how composed music from mixed origins of concert, folk, jazz, and pop can be used to introduce or bridge between segments. There's a world of possibilities now that you have a fuller sound picture, especially for pop-oriented composers who naturally use piano and keyboard in their scoring. Your score should emulate what you see in your score reading assignments. A grand staff for piano with a miniature staff above for the violinist. In some notation applications like Sibelius, you can set this violinist's staff to a miniature size. This accommodates more notes per bar horizontally and more systems per page vertically. Even though your assignment is only a couple of minutes long, you should provide rational page turns wherever possible, with a bit of rest at the bottom of the right-hand page in which to turn it. You'll also need to extract the violin part separately for the player. In this case, the part should have a normal staff size. I'm guessing that a lot of composers are still trying to catch up with last week's assigned reading and viewing of the orchestration resources. Some students may still be waiting to receive the orchestration manuals they ordered. So I'm not going to add any more to that list today. Just get through last week's list, do this week's score study, and work on your scoring assignment. One last little bit of bonus viewing I'll add, though. The Patreon-based Term Zero catch-up course resulted in a series of useful videos for developing composers. I'm going to make one of these public, a metaphorical look at why we create, how and why we should apply craft to our scoring, and how to build up a strong melodic idea through sketching. If you've been struggling with melodic development, the basic strategy outlined in this video may prove helpful. You can apply these principles to composing any work, not just the assignment given in the video. I have to stress here, though, the assignment in the video has now expired, and it was only for Patreon supporters who took the MOOC Term Zero course between May and June of 2016. So please don't worry about that, but just use what you can from that video if the approach could help your craft. Also, I'd like to recommend a couple of other Orchestration Online videos for viewing if you haven't seen them yet. Composing Schedule and Getting Unstuck, from my Orchestration Questions playlist. You may actually want to watch the whole playlist, which I've linked on the curriculum page for this week's lesson, along with scores, videos, and other resources. There's a link in the description below, so click through and get started, and I'll be back in a couple of weeks for Lesson 3.